we all want to make disciples. I think I think that should be, our, other than our own personal holiness, we should want to make disciples. And the reason is, is because we should be overjoyed with our salvation, that we would like to see that happen to others. And if we're not, and if you don't feel quite that way, because Jesus says it, that'll work until you feel it. I have found that when you do what Jesus says, even if your heart's not completely there, it will get there eventually. I think he's wired us that way. And so I have three points to make about all of us trying to do uh, this work. And this is our main goal here at this church this year, because uh, we've been really getting, I think, fired up together. I, I think that we're starting to hit on all cylinders, and I think that this is the time. The first thing we need to do is pray, of course. We have to pray. Without prayer, we cannot sync up with what God wants us to do fully. Yeah, we should always want to spread the gospel, but we do have to pray. When the church in Antioch decided to send out some preachers, Paul and Barnabas. In chapter 13, verse 2, it said, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now, I don't know if they had a plan where they were going. I think they did, but I don't think it always synced up with what the Lord wanted. Later on, when Paul and Barnabas tried to get into Asia, the Holy Spirit said, no. So they decided Bithany. The Spirit of Christ said, no. So they ended up going to uh, Corinth. But, you know, I, I think about that. I think about the Lord's hand in our efforts because he knows where his people are, and he knows where those who are seeking for him are. You know, when Jesus said, when you seek, knock, and ask, he said, it will be given to those who are seeking the Holy Spirit. I have no way of determining that. I've never been able to look at somebody and know if they're seeking the Spirit at all. And, and I think that we have to work through the Spirit with God to find these people, and they have to find us. I was, uh, with Vernon and I, was, we were talking a little bit about how that works, the mystery of conversion. And, 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 and I think that we have to be, first of all, serving what God's will is. We should always be trying, but we shouldn't be discouraged if the Holy Spirit he says, we're not here, not now, not yet. But we also have to be ready. We have to be ready for that. The Spirit told Philip, run up to that chariot. That wasn't Philip's idea. He was told to do that. And so, even though we're not going to be hearing the Holy Spirit audibly, we can pray, we can even fast, and we can send out men and to do this. And I think we have to rely on the Holy Spirit's wisdom as to how that works out and accept it. You know, there, there, I have watched people become come to Christ for a number of years, and it's never really according to plan. It's a surprise. It's somebody you didn't expect just walking in. We didn't find them. I've seen people sit among us for years and not and not become Christians until many years later. I've seen it where people thought they were Christians and didn't know they weren't. Anyhow, we have to rely on prayer. In Revelation 3, the church in Philadelphia was given an open door. Now, one characteristic of that church was that they were faithful. They had no blemishes, nothing bad to say about them. And I've always thought that is a reason for that open door. 
And I think when God wants to adopt new people into his family, he probably wants that family to be a not dysfunctional family. He might want a church that's really above reproach to be bringing people in there. Or he might providentially send them to another church. I would like to be part, and I know you all, of a church that has no censure from the Lord and that's ready, willing, and able to be used and serve. Another thing that I think helps us in fulfilling this task is we have to have a mental attitude of not just confidence, but bravery. I have noticed that when you're in a rough environment, and I'm sure some of you have been there, I've been on some job sites where you feel like your life's in danger. And, you know, I've found and the Bible says it, but if you are very bold about your faith, you'll find that works a lot better than being timid and unsure in a, in a place where you might not be liked. I've found that if people know that you're just going to be gleefully, happily telling them about the gospel, and there's nothing they can do about it, they're not going to bother you too much. They might just avoid you because they don't like the your happiness, and they don't want to hear about the Lord. If they think they're intimidating you, they're going to have an upper hand. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, we have a recorded prayer from the church. And they were responding to the persecution that had gone on and, and uh, how Peter and, and John had been arrested. And so they, they, they made a prayer. And this prayer, to me, is interesting because they didn't pray for protection. They did not pray that those who were opposing them and mistreating them might have a change of heart. They prayed for boldness. The prayer was to affect them, not anything else, not the world, not other people. We need to pray to, to improve and prepare ourselves for the task. And they prayed for boldness. And we need to pray for that when we're heading out for this task, because every one of us really has this task laid on us. We have to expect rejection and not take it personally. Jesus said, whoever receives you receives me, and he receives, and that means he receives the Father. And it works the other way. If they reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the message from Jesus that comes from his Father. We, can, we must expect that. We have to have the type of attitude where if we're rejected, we are confidently certain we've done what's right. Jesus taught in Luke 9 that if they were not received, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony to them. I've never literally done that. But what it tells me is, is that if we sow the seed and it comes back, we've done our duty and be proud of what you've done. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 28, Paul said, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, not in any way being intimidated by your opponents, for this to them is evidence of their own destruction and of us of salvation. We are told not to be intimidated, whether you feel it or not. Nobody can read your heart anyhow. You can keep it to yourself. If you're scared, they don't have to know it. And I think that's what he's saying here. God told Jeremiah chapter 1, he said, Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Verse 17, Therefore prepare yourself and arise and speak to them all that I command you, and do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. See, that would have been a, a lack of confidence. God can't have that. He can't have representatives of the creator of the universe acting timid and afraid of our opponents. How unbecoming is that? We are, we may be the only godliness they ever see. We need to make sure it's suitable for the one we serve. We have to as Paul said in Galatians 1, we are not here to please people. 
If I were here to please people, I would not be a slave of Christ. I try to keep that in mind. Slaves do not have a will of their own. Christ is my master, and I have to do what he says. And it is his will that, that many sons are brought to glory, and he's using us to do that. And so we have to have that attitude. We have to have the confidence and bravery suitable for a child of God. And finally, I don't believe there's anyone here who's a Christian that can't explain to somebody else why they're a Christian. If you were to ask, and I'm going to use Vernon again, how did you become an electrician? If he said, I have no idea. If his employer said that. Can you imagine that? And, and just transfer that illustration to yourselves. Who doesn't know who and what they are and how they got there? I, uh, yes, yeah, some people do. But we should know how and why we are children of God. When were we born again? How did this happen? How, do, how does somebody who asked me get to be what he sees in me? I should be able to explain that. You know, I was thinking of the talents that Jesus talked about. Those talents were given out according to ability. Okay, there's a proportionality. So the talents were things to work with, and it's based on our ability. And I've thought, what does that one talent man have? I think he had the ability to tell others who Jesus is and how he gave, became a Christian, to tell him about righteousness and judgment to come about baptism to get those sins forgiven and so he can be part of the body of christ so he can be saved and be baptized into christ we ought to be able to do that and i think that is probably an example in my opinion of what the one talent person is he can tell others who jesus is because i know everyone's a christian can do that Jesus said that that one talent man dug a hole and hid that talent. Because, as he said in verse 25, I was afraid. We cannot, if that's our only talent, to tell others who we are, how we got here, and where we're going, we're, we're burying that most important talent. And Jesus said, you wicked, lazy slave. I don't want to hear that. I'm sure nobody does. So let's fulfill the very basic purpose of service to Christ in telling people who Jesus is, why we love him, what he's done for us, and what we look forward to, what our hope is. We have to know how to use that sword of the Spirit right here. And when it comes to this, just like with any tool, the more comfortable you are with it is because you know how to use it. When it comes to sharing the gospel, there's not a lot to remember. It's no one's expecting you to disclose mysteries, to solve riddles, to explain who Jesus is and why he's here and how the angels function. No. We only have to know, just say seven verses. And it'll give us confidence, wherever we are, to explain to people what it means to become a Christian. We start with Matthew 28, 19. We make disciples by baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's how we do it. Acts 2, 20, 38. We are... People are to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins so that they might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for all time. To explain how Paul in Acts 22, 16 said that he was told to arise and be baptized, washing away his sins, calling, invoking the name of the Lord. And Romans 6, 4 explains to us how we die with Christ so that we might live and be raised with him. So that's how we become a new person in Christ. In Christ, the motif, it's explained in Galatians 3.27. We are baptized into Christ. 
In Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, we have a circumcision performed on our hearts by Jesus. He operates on us, and he strips off that old body of sin when we are baptized. And it's the working of God. It's his work. In 1 Peter 3, 21, yes, baptism does save us. And you know what? You've done your job. You don't have to argue. You don't have to go through any more than explaining the truth because Jesus' sheep will hear him. Okay? Jesus is, the people in earth in Jesus' day did not all listen to him. And he explained it. Only my sheep hear my voice. No one else. We don't know what that person looks like. I don't know anyone who can, has any luck at that. You, you can't. You cannot look at a human being and evaluate if they are ready for the gospel, if they are looking for the gospel. You don't know. They could have been looking for weeks or months and just be having a bad day, and you think, well, that person's in a bad mood. You don't know. You don't know at all. It could be somebody trembling in fear. It could be somebody who's acting cocky, like who's, who thinks there's something. But deep down, you don't know who is afraid of losing their soul. You don't know who needs Jesus. So we just have to take our, all of our opportunities that are presented to us confidently, cheerfully spreading the word and let what happens, happens. It's not your responsibility. Only Jesus saves. We just tell them about Jesus. And if anyone here knows that they need to be baptized, because through that you become a child of God, you're no longer in the devil's kingdom if you do this. You leave, you're transferred to the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's such an easy process, and yet one that so many people stumble to do. Become a child of God while you can. Take it. Somebody's offering you eternal life for free. All you have to do is sacrifice your will to his, and he will be your shepherd.